Thank you. And we bow our heads now for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this, another uh, most gracious opportunity to present to Chicago the gospel of Jesus Christ. To these elected ones who are waiting for the coming of the righteous Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that when we leave tonight that our hearts may be like those who coming from Emmaus said, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us along the way? We're expecting you to come soon, Lord, to receive us into your great kingdom beyond here where there is no more sorrow or death. Where there will be no more long prayer meetings and no more praying through with people. And it will all be over then and we'll enter into the joys of the Lord. That we, by the grace of God, we feel that we're partakers of through Jesus Christ. Grant these things, Father. And if there be any seed that's been in the hearts of the people and never has come to life yet, may something be done tonight that will quicken that life, Lord to a realization of the message of this end time in which we're living. Bless the ministers here in Chicago. Bless the businessman, Father. And tomorrow morning's breakfast, oh God, give me something to say that'll stir those men, their hearts. Grant it, Father. Help us then tomorrow night over at the Lane Tech and Sunday the double service back here. Grant it, Lord. May souls be saved people healed, the kingdom of God exalted, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Got that song for in the morning? Got that song for in the morning? I was glad when I was speaking with Brother Vale here just a few moments ago. I come in just a a little late myself, and I know it's hot, but just imagine you sitting there and then moving around up here. um, But we're always happy, no matter what condition it's in, uh, to be here. Just think of the days of our Lord down there in Palestine, when those sun rays, hot in his throat, raw, him standing there and real weak and and preach on and heal the sick. He's just the same today as he was then. He still feels the same way. His, his grace is sufficient for all that we have need of. Now, this is the night that I try to put these three nights for praying for the sick and speaking on the sick, prayer for the sick. Now, the other times I'll speak different on salvation because... I got a double service each day. See, and I can't, I can't have a. If I preach hard, I got to eat, and if I eat, I can't have these kind of services. See, and I got to, and I can't have two services in a day and make one of them a healing service. It's just you, you're full of food, and your blood's gone to your stomach to digest the food, and then your brain just don't work right in that way. So, I'd, I'd um, perhaps maybe then. Talk tonight, we give it over for prayer for the sick again tonight. I told Billy, I think he said, did he, did he give out prayer cards? Does anybody know? Okay. okay, then we'll get to them just as quick as we can. And now, let's just be reverent, listen close, and then in the prayer line, let's come with all the respects that we know how to believe God's uh, here to heal us. Now, we are very uh, grateful for the visions. That's my ministry is centered around that until about this time, waiting any minute for something else to come, which is coming. Now, I have what kind of weakened me a little was this last week. We come home from Arizona, and we're going right back Monday and, uh, to Arizona. And then home, I've had people that's been waiting down in that line for three or four years for them personal interviews from Texas, from Arkansas, and uh, all around over the country, waiting for those personal interviews. There's where you find the real thing. You get, just got one person and you sitting together. Then the Holy Spirit just keeps moving and revealing. 
A little strange thing happened the other day. I had around 15, I guess, or 20 in one day. And sitting in my study early that morning before going there, the great Holy Spirit came in and told me every person that was coming, every question they would ask, every dream and every interpretation, I wrote it out on paper and laid each one of them down. And then I would go into the room and these people we'd never met before, they would come in and talk to them and show each question they had asked and all about it in routine and the dream that they had. Then reach over and get a piece of paper and hand it over to them where it was already told before he ever got there what would take place. Now, only God can do that. You know I couldn't do that. Anyone knows it's, that a human being cannot do that. We have no way of doing it. That's another paradox as we spoke of last night. And then to see the accuracy of the Holy Spirit when it tells a certain thing will happen, it's just exactly like that. Now, if any of you hearing about that vision of going up here in the north woods to a place that never known and about that seven foot silver tip grizzly and that 42 inch caribou and where it would be laying, it's laying on my den room floor. <laughs> Just exactly where it was said, the place it was said, how it would happen, and exactly word by word. How many ever heard the tape, sirs, what time is it just before it went out west? The reason the angel of the Lord sent me out there, he told me, he said, now coming from the heavens will be seven angels in a constellation. There will be three on the side and one in the top. It will be like a triangle or a, something like a pyramid. And I said, the one on the right had his wings turned back, and I swept right into the constellation by him. And he was to tell me what to do. And I went at west, just as he told me. It was up there on the very same day. And when they started coming from heaven, I said, there'll be a sound like a great blast, something like a, a breaker of an airplane, a sound breaker going forth. But I said, it'll be so much louder than that, and I'll be just north, uh, east of Tucson, about... 50 or 100 miles, something like that, and Tucson will be sitting this way, and I'll be picking some kind of cucklebirds or uh, goat heads, they call them there, off of my trouser leg, and I said, a blast will go off, and we were up there at that day, and I was over to myself. There's a man, I think, Brother Softman is here tonight that was with me, he and Brother Norman. Are you here, Brother Fred? I thought I heard you say amen the other night. I thought he was here. Maybe I was mistaken. I, I, well, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, Brother Fred. Yeah. Uh, we were up there, and on the day just before it happened, the Holy Spirit came right into the little camp where we were camped at and said, uh, begin to reveal about our children, what they must do, and how our condition, things that were taking place among them, and tell us what to do and so forth. I just had to get up and walk away. And the next morning, I found out where the javelina were, and I was trying to tell these two brethren how to get to them. And I went across the mountain, down over a little, uh, what we'd call a little hogback-like, and I had Brother Southman there to go over to another place where I'd seen those javelina the day before. I'd already got mine. And so uh, I was trying to get these brother in position uh, for it, because I, these brother many a times, I, I guide for them. And... Uh, I told Brother Norman to come the other way and put Brother Fred in the middle, and then I'd go this way, and if I hit the mountain and they run this way, I would just fire up in the air to run them back that way again so he could pick out the one he wanted. And we got out there, and there was no javelina, and I glassed Brother Fred about a mile away, and I could see him. He went back up the mountain when there was no javelina. I went down the mountain to a great chasm, come up, sat down. It was about 8 o'clock at morning. I'd folded my legs and was off of my overhauls, was picking some of them goat heads. And I said, you know, look here, isn't that strange? I said, this is exactly, and I'm perfectly in the position, north, east of Tucson, Flagstaff. See? And i am be east of Flagstaff, northeast of Tucson. And I said, here's these goat heads that I said I'd be picking off of my... I said, that's strange. And I just throwed it down like that and looked up on the side across a great chasm. There was a whole herd up there. They were almost in shooting distance, so I, I wouldn't shoot them myself because I didn't want them. I said, if I can just get the Brother Fred and them now and get him over there. And I run over a little ravine along a ledge. 
And as I was running along there, all of a sudden, it sounded like the whole country come apart was such a blast. And it scared me to, I thought, I was wearing a black hat, big black hat, and that just looked like a javelina. Any, I thought somebody had shot me. And it, and it just scared me to, I jumped up in the air. Just then, I thought, what is this all about? I seen the rocks tumbling off the side of the hill, rolling down. And I looked up. There was that white circle above me there, circling around. Here comes seven angels come moving down out of the air, pick me up and say, go back to your home to the east right away and bring those seven seals for their seven mysteries, for the complete word is revealed now in these seven mysteries. If you've never heard, if you ever believed I ever said anything in a sermon inspired, you take them tapes of the seven seals. I'm not a tape salesman. I, the, Mr. Softman here sells tapes, him and Mr. McGuire, but I don't sell tapes. They take them. And if you ever heard anything, it's really, it's, I can say it's, thus saith the Lord. Get those. And you know, not in that time, I didn't know it, but cameras from all over the country was taking the picture of that as a white cloud settled down. One on Associated Press, I think your Chicago paper packed it all around. Life magazine packed it. How many seen it in there, that mister? That's, that was it right there. Just exactly what it said. Standing right under it when it come down and farm. They said it was way beyond. And it's a hundred country. There's no airplanes or nothing in there. And it was too high. 26 miles high where there is no vapor or nothing. You could, they couldn't have made vapor anyhow. And 30 miles across it. And here it comes settling down. And watch on the right hand side of that constellation. If it isn't, read the tapes or listen to the tape. Sirs, what time is it? About three or four months before it happened. There it is. Even science has to recognize it to be true. They're studying it. They say it's a mystery. They can't understand. The science down there in Tucson are, are trying to understand it, what it is. I thought first I'd go talk to him. I thought, no, it'd be just like that picture of the angel Lord on the picture. They wouldn't believe it. There's no need to tell them. So, but you see, in the face of all of it, they have to know that it's truth anyhow. That it's the truth. Brother, sister, I don't know when. I'll make my last trip to Chicago one day. This may be it, but I'm telling you in the name of the Lord Jesus, the gospel is true. This is the last days we're living in the shadows of his coming. Whatever you do, press into the kingdom of God. If there's one little touch strikes your heart, you come quickly while you have the opportunity to come. Because the hour is approaching when it'll be too late, and then you'll never want to come no more. There won't be any more call in your heart. And no matter how much you did try, you'd never get in. When the last member is added to that body for the rapture, there'll never be another in Satan. The doors are closed as it was in the days of Noah, and there will be no more salvation left, though people will think there will be. That's where the trouble's going to come. See? One time Jesus came, John's disciples came over to Jesus and they said, uh, uh, we're sent from John, do, do we look for another or what about it? And he said, just stay and watch what happens. And then anyway, if they went back across the mountain, uh, Jesus watched him. He said, what would you go out to see when you went to see John? A man saw Freeman. He said, they're in King's palaces. Did you go to see a reed shaking with any wind? No, not, not John. And he said, well, what did you go to see a prophet? He said, I say in more than a prophet. If you can receive it, this is he who is spoken of. I send my messenger before my face. Malachi 3. Then speaking of John one time, the disciples said, when he's talked about where he was going up to Jerusalem to be offered up, they said, well, why is it we're taught in the scriptures by the scribes that Elias must first come and restore all things? He said, Elias has already come and you didn't know it. Now look, to those scribes, can you hear me say amen? amen? Those scribes, even those apostles, that their very last sign was looking for Elias. Let me repeat it. The, uh, the, the very elected, the scribes and the apostles called of the Lord. We're looking for the Messiah to come, but Elias to come and forerun his coming. 
And he come it in, and did it in such humility and so they even didn't recognize him. And may I say this as my own thought. One of these days you're looking for a lot to happen that's happening and you don't know it. You're going to say before the rapture of the church. Now, I'm not here preaching doctrine. There's ministers on the platform here that would disagree probably with this. Most all ministers believe that the church goes through the tribulation period for purification. I can't see it. The blood of Jesus Christ is our purification. Nothing to do See, I believe that the church, the denominational church, and the sleeping virgin does go through the tribulation, but not the bride. There's a difference between the church and the bride. The bride goes in the rapture. That's where you, Church of God, or Danerson, all got mixed up there, see. Is in that not saying telling you what you did or didn't? I'm not to say that. But it's the way I see it. The first thing you know, you're going to say, Well, I thought there was supposed to be a rapture before the tribulation. The tribulation is going to strike. And what would it be off if you heard say, It's already been, and you didn't know it. There will be one in the field. I'll take one and leave one. Just somebody come up missing. There'll just be a very, very few in that rapture. That'll be changed. The sleeping bride, the bride that's been taken through the age, she'll come forth first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them. Just one here and one there and one over here. At least every day across the world, there's as many as 500 people missing. And what if there's a thousand They'd say, oh, well, this woman, she just run off somebody. This preacher, he took some other man's wife and gone. He's gone to glory in the rapture, and they won't know it. Did not he say he would come as a thief in the night? You say, well, if he comes, I'll see him. No, no, just those that's going to see him is going to see him at that time. See, just like that light, like John stood there and saw that that. Spirit of God like a light dove coming down and going up on the voice saying, This is my beloved son. Nobody heard it or saw it but John. Okay? And when that rapture takes place, it'll be a change. And the first thing you know, that change, then we're caught into them and gone away. And the sleeping virgin, it moves right on just the same and thinking everything's going fine. And they're already gone. It's already happened. And you knew it not. I don't say it'll be like that, remember. I'm not saying the Lord tells me to be that way, but I believe it's so close at hand, it's possible. I don't want to take any chance. I want to be ready. I want everything ready. I, I, I don't want to ever wait laid aside whether how it comes. Probably the way we got it all brought out will be different. It always is. And what he's, we have it planned. He, his first coming was that way, and his second coming will probably be the same thing. Let's pray now. Let's be sincere. Chicago, you know, I'm a southerner. I'm used to hospitality in the south. you got a big city here. A big, great, big city with five million people in it. But I don't know of any big city in the world that's really, from the people over, is as friendly and nice as people in Chicago. That's right. These Chicago people are nice people. Even you get out here on the street and... We was talking even winos and everything else. They, they respect you and nice. I, I, I really appreciate that. And let me tell you, with a vision the other morning, I know that some of the bride is waiting here in Chicago for the coming of the Lord. I know there's going to be a punch out of this city taken. According to a vision which has never failed, and I know this, God's got people in here going in that rapture. I, I believe that in that day. I think I said enough and got far enough to I have to quit saying now, so let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us now as we go to the Word. May the people clearly understand, Lord, that human beings, we are together and we know that we get tired and worn. And, but I pray that you'll grant one more time tonight to shake this little church, Lord, with your power, with the Word. May there not be a feeble person among us. Lord, we thank Thee because that we believe that when we ask these things, we receive them. 
I pray that, it, that you'll just do a great thing among us tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, I commit myself with this text that I'm going to read, and I pray that you'll unfold it to us in a great way that the people might clearly understand. Amen. I wish for you, if you want to, care at this time, and it's almost, I'm going to try to make it exactly at the time tonight, if I can, of getting out a little earlier than I did last night, anyhow. But turn with me to the St. Luke's Gospel, or I beg your pardon, let's change that. I got Luke wrote down here, but I, I'm turned over here also to Matthew. Matthew, the 15th chapter beginning with the 21st verse. St. Mark gives a record of it too. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and saw him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, Help me. But he answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. We have here under consideration a, a quite a lengthy scripture reading, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, which you could stay all night as it was. Anyone knows, because all the scripture is given by inspiration. I believe that. But I want to take one word uh, to make a, a text out of it. I'm going to call the word perseverance. The word perseverance means to be persistent and persistent in making a goal to, or, or doing something. And every man that's in all ages that's ever uh, ever made anything out of themselves or done anything would be persistent in uh, the uh, thing they were trying to achieve. And before you can be persistent, you have to have faith in what you are trying to achieve. And if you haven't got faith and what you're trying to do, you'll never be able to do it. Now that little word faith means so much, and yet we strike it so lightly. I hear so many people say and come in, it's amazing, say, oh, I've got faith, and not disregarding their effort, but you know, sometimes those that claim they have so much faith, I find has less than those that says nothing about it. They, they are built up to an emotion and not a real faith. There's quite a bit difference but a hope and emotion with hope than being quiet and using faith. See, faith is something, it's a substance. It's not something that, that you just jump at and haphazardly hit at and hope so. It's something that you know you have it. The, the thing that you're, you're asking for, there's no human way of ever explaining how you're going to get it, but yet you know it's there. You have it. It is a substance. 
If I could get that so that you'd understand clearly, it would mean so much to the meeting tonight. If in this night of this healing service, or we are trusting, I, I say that healing because I believe that God's going to do it. I believe that God is going to, to do what he promised to do. And if I didn't do that, I'd be afraid to stand here in this audience of people and make these statements that I do make because if I had the least bit of fear about it, I'd better never enter that door. You've got to absolutely believe it. And you have the assurance and there's nothing can move it. You, if, if, no matter what happens, you still believe it. Even though it seems like it's failed, you still believe it. No matter what happens, you still believe it. Like the little lady sitting here looking at me here the other night. Mrs. Way had been taking care of her. Her husband was raised the other day from the, a dead dying in a heart attack. And I walked off the platform and because when I seen him, his eyes go back and die, I, I, I didn't know what to do. And I went down there to check his heart and feel him and see he was gone. Then I had to be to him. And then the other night I was asked the question, why didn't you go down to that lady? She turned around. Or, or Mrs. Wade tried to get her out. And she dropped in the floor and her face turned white. And just as almost gone. And why did you not go down there? Because that I had no reason to go there. See, a faith isn't something that somebody else is trying to get you to do. It's something God commissions you to do. See? I seen the lady was only, she was very sick but intoxicated by drug. Not uh, trying to get well. Doctor giver, and I seen her sitting laughing and rejoicing. And what's the use of me going down there after it's already over? <laughs> and someone said, "But Mr. Wade would he would he would have laid there." But we had to go do this. But when the woman was back outside, uh, yet the vision come, and she's sitting here tonight. Fine, laughing last night. See, you you got to know, and you cannot know until you have faith, and faith produces that know. So faith is that know. Faith is that thing that says it. Now, now when we see this uh, perseverance, any man that's trying to achieve anything has been persevering. For instance. George Washington is called the father of this nation. One night he prayed all night in the snow. And when the real, genuine, first-blooded Americans that had taken their stand upon this ground and the great economy that they had in common was at stake, and there was about 70% or more of those American soldiers standing out there didn't even have shoes on their feet. Their feet was froze and wrapped in rags. But yet, they had a leader that they believed in. And that leader believed in the leader, God. And he prayed until he's clothes was wet up to his waist, kneeling in the snow. And there was a frozen Delaware between him and where the British was taking their, their picnic at the other side. But the frozen Delaware didn't stand in his way, neither did his opposition of his frozen soldiers and their feet frozen and the ice in the river. He was perseverant. He had faith that God was going to give him the victory, and he 
the Delaware couldn't stay in his way. And he achieved the purpose, although three musket bullets went right through his coat, but it never touched him. He was persevering. He had heard from God, and he had faith that what God had told him was the truth, and nothing could stop him. If every sick person in here tonight could just have faith in God, like George Washington did, your Delaware, it stands before you tonight, would have to melt away some way you would cross it. No matter what your opposition is, you'd still cross it. You'd be persistent, so persistent that cancer, tumor, whatever it is, would never be able to stand there because you'd cross over to the promise that God had given you. Man can only be persistent uh, after they have, uh, have heard from God. Faith is only based on the Word of God because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Noah, in the, the opposition that he preached in, in the days of his time, in preparing the ark, after he heard God tell him that he was going to destroy the world with water, that sin had heaped up so high that he couldn't stand it no more, he's going to wash the world off with water. And there was not a bit of water in the skies. But yet Noah was persevering in the time of critics. No matter how much people told him it can't happen, nor know it was going to happen. Because, and being persevering, he never just said, well, I laid the foundation of the ark. I, I guess I, that, that'll be enough then if the science has already proved I'm on the wrong grounds. That's what many people does about coming to Christ. They lay the foundation of believing on the Lord Jesus and accepting Him as personal Savior and maybe going on to Christian baptism. But when it comes to following on through to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, somebody explains it away for them. That's the reason that seed fell over the wayside or it fell on stony grounds. But the man and woman who has faith that God, that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that His Word is just as real now and ever promised, just as true as it ever was, there is no minister, nobody, nobody can explain it away from them. They're persevering. They climb on until they achieve what they purpose to do. There is no way to explain it away from them. They believe it. Moses, he did the same thing. He, would, he had forgotten the vision and the feeling of the people. But when he met God in that burning bush, and he seen that that was God's word. See, Moses had just come up under good teaching his mother and had been taught the way of God. But when he got up there and met this person that his mother had taught him about, you see what I mean? Many people take the Bible and understand it intellectually perfect. But that's, that's not it. That's not what we're talking about. No matter how well you can explain it, you've got to meet the author of it personally. Then's what brings faith. For the author lives in you after you're born of him. Moses met the author. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and of, of Jacob. And I remember my promises and I've come to send you. Amen. I'm sending you to deliver them. And notice when he performed his first sign, and it seemed like it failed because he had a lot of impersonators. Uh, the Egyptians could do the same thing that he did. But you see, 
Moses, after he had met God in the burning bush and know that he was God, it didn't make any difference how many more impersonated it and what kind of a character they was that did it. Moses knew that his was genuine, that it come from God. He just stood still in the face of Pharaoh, and then his snake eat up the rest of them. That's the way people do today. They maybe, if they're not sure, if they're worked up on some emotion, and they see somebody else get off on the deep end of something and go on, then they think, well, maybe mine, but, but that man who really meets God and knows that he knows what happened. It, it's God. Certainly. No one could explain it away from him. David, a little ruddy fella, he wasn't big enough to carry a firearms or a sword, rather, in that day. His shield, he was, was too little. He happened to be what we call the runt. And his father couldn't have nothing for him to do. He, his brother's a big, strong, strapping man, so he thought he could get David a job, maybe a herd and some sheep. And the little fellow stayed out there, and, and he met God. And he, he, had a, he was detailed to take care of those sheep. And David was a prophet. And the word of the Lord came to him in song. And Jesus said, Have not you heard uh, in the Psalms how things was predicted of him, you know? And David was a, a prophetic songwriter. And while he was out there looking up and hearing the wind pass through the mountains and down through the cedars, he rode to the shady green pastures and still waters and so forth, inspirationally. As he rolled in at night watching the stars and the moon and, and uh, how nature worked, God visited him. Yeah. And he knew uh, there was God. And one day a bear came in and got one of his sheep. And the sheep meant a lot to him because he had learned to love that sheep. And he, he loved it. And so when the bear come in and got one, David's heart began to burn when he heard that little sheep cry. And God had sent him to watch those sheep. And so when the bear caught the little lamb and it started crying, David all at once remembered that the God that made the mountain. Was his God. So he puts a rock in his little slingshot and went after this big grizzly and he struck the grizzly and down he went. Then when he come back, he was happy because he won the victory. And then a bigger trial come in, a lion, which is far more fierce than the bear would be. He's more game. And if I had time, I'd like to break those animals down and show you the great parable in there. And the lion come in and grab one around. So if God could give him victory over the bear, he sure could give him victory over the lion. Oh, if God, who can give me victory over myself, amen, can surely give me victory over the disease that's trying to take me from him. God that can save me and make me something that I'm not. When I'm not a Christian, he can make a Christian out of me. By believing his word. Then we find that he got the bear and finally the great showdown come. When there come a, a great big grizzly bear bigger than any of them. He was a man of a giant. And David knew that with God he was more than a match for him. No matter how big the opposition was, with God he's more than a match. Yet the littlest man and most unequipped man, not a fighter, a kid, uh, not an armor, just his, his bare body, not a shield over him, but a piece of sheepskin wrapped around him. And he didn't have a spear or a sword. He had a little slingshot. You know, two little pieces of string with the leather on the end of it. 
And he wanted to fight that man because he was trying to come after God's sheep. And if God could deliver the sheep, how much more is I and his people? Chicago, that's the reason we're here. You're more than a sheep. You're God's people. And we don't have an intellectual or a great denomination behind us. But we know that sickness has caught you. And you're gripped in, in the cares of the world. And we come in the name of the Lord Jesus. Though the doctor turns you down, we don't care what he done. We come to take you back to hell. In the name of Jesus Christ with a little slingshot of his word. Two little strings, the New and Old Testament, holding Jesus between them. And we come to take you back to where you belong, if you'll just let us. Notice, little Samson also, as I spoke of last night, he was very persevering himself. As long as he could feel those seven locks hanging down his back. Uh, the, the Philistines meant nothing to him. No matter if he had nothing but a jawbone of a mule in his hand or whatever he had, the Philistines or the gates of Gaza, they meant nothing to him. As long as he could feel those seven locks. That was the covenant. And as long as the Christian can feel that covenant all things are possible to him that believeth. When you can feel that covenant faith in you, that you are God's child and an heir of every one of his promised blessings. Don't care what comes up, you're more than a match for it. As long as you can feel it and know that you do believe it. You follow me? As long as you can, as Samson felt that he, he was all right. And as long as in your heart that you're just not worked up, you're just not emotional, but in your heart, you know that you're going to get it. You know that you have confessed your sins. You know that you have passed from death to life. You know that you're a child of God and an heir of these things. Then there's nothing going to keep you from habit. Then you are persevering. Yes, John the Baptist was so perseverant that he even made this statement. Four thousand years they had looked for a Messiah. But John knew that he was going to introduce him. He knew that he had a... Jesus said he was more than a prophet. He was a prophet. But he was more than a prophet because he was a messenger of the covenant. And he was so sure of it that he is going to see that light, that dove. He's going to see the Spirit. He was so positive of it till he said, There's some standing, one standing among you now that you don't know. <laughs> I'm not worthy to lose his shoes, but he'll be the one that'll baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. God, had, he was a prophet, and more than a prophet, and he knew his charge. He knew that God had commissioned him, and there was no fear in his heart. Though 4,000 years in the midst of a bunch of howling mob of critics making fun of him and saying he was a wild man trying to drown people, that didn't stop him a bit. Somebody might say, John, aren't you afraid that it won't happen? How could it fail when God said so? God told him. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining upon, he's the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. 
John knew it. He wasn't afraid of failure. That was his charge. That was his commission. So he could be very perseverant, very persistent. No matter nothing's going to bother him. There wasn't a devil's out of torment could take him. Hallelujah. He was commissioned to do something. And heaven and earth will pass away with that world ever pale. He said, I'll see you. Now, faith had anchored. He had heard like Moses in the wilderness where prophets are, are molded. He had heard God tell him, you're the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I can point to the scriptures so show you your commission. You're the one that Isaiah said 712 years ago. There would be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. They said, are you the Messiah? He said, no, but I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And he knew that he was going to do it because God said so. Faith. Then he was persistent. The rabbis and so forth come out and said, you mean there will come a time that the daily sacrifice will be taken away? A man will take the place and so forth? He said, there's coming one that will take the place and he'll take away the daily sacrifice. He will be the lamb. And as he turned to look, he said, behold, there he is. There's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Right in the midst of his sermon, because God promised him. No matter what they say, they'll throw you in jail. The ministerial association will kick you out. You'll not have any fellowship. There's no cooperation. Didn't make John any difference. He was perseverant. He had a message. Somebody must hear it. Now, his entire group, I don't think he got about 12, but he got something. When he got the power of God on him, then the Lord began to move on him. Now, the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we can see the commission of the law, then you can be persevering. My, this little Greek woman, she had heard of him. She had never seen him, but she just heard of him. She had heard of his fame. Well, we hear the same thing. We hear of his fame. We read of his fame. We see his fame. And faith cometh by hearing. Somehow or another, faith finds a source that others don't see. When you are predestinated to a certain thing, you can look right at it because your faith is declaring it and others know nothing about it. Faith finds that source that you can't see. Because others are looking at it from observations and so forth. And they're looking at it presuming. And the word presume is to adventure without authority. And Moses never went down into Egypt presuming that God was with him. He went down into Egypt knowing God was with him. You don't accept your healing thinking God will do it. You accept your healing because God's already done it. He promised it, and your faith says it's so, and nothing else can wipe it out. Now, his word is a sword, the Bible said. In Hebrews 4.12, it said the word of God is a sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. That's what the word does. Now, the only thing that can handle this sword is a hand. And the only thing that can handle... God's Word is faith. If the Word is a sword, then faith holds it, grips it. And when people are dueling, like if the two men meet, and with these knives, they're, they're dueling. That's you and the devil trying to get you to doubt. Now, your sword that you got may be ever so good. It's a million times better than his. I'm going to tell you, his is not even a sword, it's a stick. But yours is a sword. But if the hand that holds that sword is weak, 
the stick can overcome him. But no matter how little this hand is, if it holds the Word of God with faith, there's nothing going to do it. It can put anything down. You see, he's holding it in his right hand and you in your right hand. And when your sword's locked, when you lock with the devil, is it so or not so? Now, he's pressing to you, say it's wrong, it's wrong. You mustn't believe it. But if you believe it, see, these swords come right straight down to the handles. Now, if I can push his back with my handle, the blade, like that, where I'm at, I'm directed right straight to his heart because I'm on the right side at his left. And then when I'm pressing with faith, with the word, Satan, Jesus Christ commissioned me to do this. And we lock him. And raise up with a hand of faith and say, An angel of God let me honor and set it so the first thing all goes with the right in, and he's conquered. I come to challenge you and thus saith the Lord. That's the believer when he has faith to handle the word. Now if you're just a little denominational weakling, you better keep away from it. You'll go around and talk about it and say it can't happen because you don't know nothing about it. Well, that man who's handled it and seen it conquer that enemy, he knows what it'll do. This poor little woman, she had never seen him, but she had heard of him. She had many hindrances, but her faith didn't have any hindrances. Faith don't have any hindrance at all. You might have a lot of hindrances. You might have the doctor's word, the scientific man who's examined you. It might be he, that man told you, you you're going to die. You, that's all he knows. He, he's told you all he's studied. His scientific uh, work shows that, that you must die. Your whole system's made in, in that kind of a way that death has struck it and there's nothing can keep it from going on. You're going, now that's as much as he knows. No science has no medicine for it. But you found something. You pick up the sword. See? Now, of course, you got a hindrance. you got something's going to do against you, that devil, that disease, that affliction. But when you strike the tip of swords with that devil the other and say, It's thus saith the Lord, he revealed it to me, and I am healed. Yeah. Oh, my. Your faith don't have any hindrances. You know, let's take some of her hindrances and look at them just a few minutes before we call our prayer line. They might have said to her in the first place, you're a Greek. He's a Jew. Well, and otherwise they might have said, you know, your denomination is not sponsoring this meeting. Your church is not. But you know, that didn't hinder her. Faith had already struck. She had heard of somebody else being healed, and she had a need, and something told her it could be done. Now, see, the works of God are foreordained of God. You believe that? Jesus met a blind man one time. Said, who sinned, him or his mother, or so forth, or his daddy? Said, neither one, but that the works of God might be made manifest. See, this is the works of God. And when you feel something pressing to you, hold on to it. That's God speaking to you. Well, she was still persevered, even though they said that you don't belong to his people and your church is not cooperating in the meeting. She was persevering anyhow. She's going anyhow. She might have went down the road and met another group of Greeks. And they, they tell her, wait a minute. The days of miracles is past. That's just a lot of a hocus pocus. That's just a bunch of a man, some so-called prophet down there doing all these kind of things that, uh, you know, uh, that, that's just nonsense. Amen. Why, there's nothing like that today. But still she was persevering. Yeah, yeah. She still believed it was going to happen. Now that's when you got it. That's when something happens. She might have went on down the next corner she met her husband. And her husband said... If you go down and associate yourself in that group, I'm going to leave you. Well, she, he can leave if he wants to. But she's still persistent. <laughs> she's persevering. She's got a need and faith's already anchored. She knows it's going to happen. On down the next corner, she met a bunch of people and said, You know what? 
You'll be the laugh of the town. If you go down there to ask mercy for your daughter and you'll find out it's no more than some others has asked and didn't get it. No make any difference what the others did and what the others have laughed at. She was still persistent. She knew what was going to happen. She, she believed it. She had heard of him. And she knew that she could ever get there what was going to happen. Now, we might have went out the corner and met the pastor, and he said, you'll be put out of your church. <laughs> if you go, look at the hindrance that poor little thing had. And remember, she's a Greek now, not a Pentecostal. <laughs> and here she goes down, and they said, you'll be put out of your church, and still she was persistent. Yes, she was persevering to make a difference where she lost her husband, she lost her friends, she's the laughing stock of the town, and whatever taking place, or he was put out of her church, or what more... Faith had caught hold. She was persevering. I like that. Now, a lot of people think that's all they have to have. As long as they get to Jesus and come where he's in the meeting, well, that's all that's necessary. It used to be that the churches, when I first started on the field, they would sit and wait and almost cry until the Lord come on the scene. And then, oh my, down here in Illinois, there's a little place called, oh, I forget where it's at. Now, one of my meetings down here years ago where the Chicago Tribune here packed an article and there's 27 ambulances set around the little hotel. One night walking to the platform, laying about a 30 minutes foundation and asking the people and challenging them to believe it. And with one prayer from the platform, after the Lord had revealed himself that he was, there wasn't a, there wasn't a person in a wheelchair or cop Deaf, dumb, or blind, nowhere. Every one of them is healed in a moment. During South Africa, we've seen 25,000 blanket natives healed at one time with seven van loads of crutches and sticks and boards that they packed them on, come down the street, and those people walking behind and singing, Only Believe. Faith, get away from your, your thoughts. Think his thoughts. You think what he thinks. You say, Brother Branham, I, 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 I think you ain't got no thought coming. Amen. Let the mind that was in Christ be in you. Yes. Then you recognize the word. Amen. Notice. When those people sat and wait, when the Lord moved in and done something, oh my, they just got up and walked away. But you know, it seems like today they've seen so much of it. And now the Lord comes. Well, shows himself among us. We say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He sure can do it. Brother Ram, uh, I'm going over to Oral Roberts next week and have him pray for me. So and so, if this don't work tonight, I have, that's just about the attitude. Oh, See, the people are not perseverant. If the Holy Spirit, if Jesus Christ proves that he's here among us, then press till you get to him. Like the little woman with the blood issue, and all of the different things that taken place in all the atmospheres in her way, she just pressed right on through till she touched him. If this church tonight would do the same thing, would press through every scale of unbelief, would lock swords with the devil and his unbelief, and press through to know that you're a child of God and an heir of these things, and Jesus Christ standing present to show you that he's with you to keep his word. Be perseverant to let nothing stand in your way. I'm just wondering if faith really anchors, could anything stand in your way? You don't get it. If you really got it, that would settle it. That's all. See, this woman here, our little Greek friend tonight that we have here before us as a text, when she arrived to Jesus... Like Jesus would arrive here with us tonight, we arrive and he comes here and proves here he is among us. Well, she thought that settled it. That don't settle it. No, sir. That's when you just begin to fight. That's when you just start your real battle. When she arrived to Jesus, then Jesus said he was not sent to her race. Oh, my And another thing, he turned around and called her race of people nothing but a bunch of dogs. I'm not sent only to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. 
That didn't stop her. She was still persevering. He said, besides, it's not meat for me to take the children's bread and give it to you dogs. Still she was persevering. Oh, I like that. Still she held on. Hey, man, I like that. Hold on to it. She was persevering. She was not a hotbed plant. <laughs> Had to be babied. No, sir. She was not a hybrid article like big part of the crop today. <laughs> you know, the beggar said, now, sister, I tell you, I would encourage you to go on because, no, sir, there was nobody there to encourage her, but even Jesus himself trying to discourage her. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Now I feel like a holy roller, sure enough. Even Christ himself sitting there trying to discourage her, but she held on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Persevering. She had arrived at something. She knew it. What if he called you a dog and you're a race, a bunch of dogs? Well, you bunch of Chicago and you, you bunch of Methodists, you Presbyterians, I wasn't even sent to you. You're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites anyhow. My, you'd stick your nose up and turn out that door. See? Why? You've never had faith to begin with. You're a hybrid, a hotbed plant that had to be sprayed all the time. Not her! No, something happened! Faith that anchored. She's not going to be defeated. Hey, man, there you go. No matter what the rest done, what the rest said, she's not going to be defeated. Oh, sir, even Jesus himself couldn't discourage her. Amen. That I'm not sent to your race. Go on. Beat it on down the street. I'm not sent to you people. And you're nothing but a bunch of dogs anyhow. I know it's not real life me take the children's bread and give it to you bunch of dogs. Alley dogs, street rats, and so forth. It's not, not me for me to do that. Watch. She admitted he was right. Amen. Oh, my. Faith will always admit the word right. Whether your pastor says so or not, whether anybody else says so or not, your faith says it's right. Lord, your faith says it's right. So what she was called even by Jesus Christ, the one she come to, and he rebuked her. And look at his disciples. The man was with him in his campaigns. Said, "Oh, Peter, get out of here! You're annoying us. Don't bother our master." That didn't stop her. No, sir. Nothing's going to stop her, cause she's got faith. It's going to happen anyhow. She admitted he was right. I'm nothing but a dog. I, I don't deserve anything. But Lord, let me bring something to your memory. I'm not add to the bread. I just want a few crumbs. <laughs> the trouble of the night, we don't have people to humble themselves to get some crumbs. I didn't get in the line. That don't make any difference. I just come to see if he's the same yesterday today. Right? I'm at you some crumbs. Oh, how different she was from now. Remember, she had never seen a miracle. She was a Greek. She had never seen a miracle. Yet she was persistent because something inside of her told her she's going to see one. She was like Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot, she didn't say, Now bring Joshua up, you spies. And let me see how he wears his clothes and what kind of a manners he's got. And let me see whether he's handsome or not, or how he combs his hair, if he's a well-groomed man and everything. Remember, that was kind of her line of work, you know. She was hunting handsome man. She was a street harlot. And so she said, I have heard that the Lord God is with you, and I'm asking for mercy. Yeah. Oh, my, there you are. Faith cometh by hearing. I heard that you took Agag and what you did down there. Amen. And I heard what God did for you at the Red Sea. Yes. And I believe it. 
And I know that you're his servant. I just ask mercy. Amen. 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 She was granted mercy. This woman, she was granted mercy. She said, true Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that's on the master's table. For this same <laughs> that did it. Finally, being persistent, perseverant, let nothing stand in her way, even in the face of Jesus trying to rebuke her. She said, but she stood and admitted that he was right. The word was right and everything. But yet, Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs. And it's just a crumb from me is all I ask. Just one little, one little, one little speck's all I want, Lord. Just your touch. That's all I want. Just your touch, that's all. Oh, if we just had that tonight. Lord, I'm sitting here, I'm sick. But if, if, I, if somebody just tell me I can get well, that's all I want to know. Then that's, that settles it. I'm going home and believe it, see. Nothing's going to stand in my way any longer. Just your crumbs, Lord, is all I want. Jesus said, O woman, or O woman, great is your faith. Go your way for what you've been persistent about. What you have believed, you're going to find it that way. <laughs> She'd finally overcome. She had the right approach to God's gift. She was a Gentile. Faith always admits the words right. Humbly and reverently. Not get out and blow up about something. Same way now. Quickly now, before we call the prayer line. Martha, in the presence of the Lord Jesus, when everybody had made fun of her, said, look, this guy that heals the sick, when you had need of him, yeah, you took your living, you fed him, you had him a room. When he come to the city, he stayed with you. He is a good friend of Lazarus. But when really sickness come in, he got away from him. See? But when she heard he had come, she was persevering. She started down the street and I said, now I guess you're going out to see him. She just closed her ears and eyes. She just kept pressing on. She was persevering. When Jesus spoke to her, she said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Right, she was persevering. Yes. Notice, like the Shunammite woman in the presence of Elijah, God's representative on the earth. Martha knew if God was in Elijah, surely he was in Jesus. The Shumanite woman, once she went up there and he said, Elisha come out of his cave and looked out there and said, here comes that Shunammite and her heart is troubled. God's kept it from me. I don't know what she wants. Said, is all well with thee, with thy husband, with the child? She said, all's well. Watch her when she told her servant, saddle this mule and go straight forward and don't stop persevering. Just keep going. Some of them say, hey, stop them and I'll talk to you, Liddy. Nothing doing. I, I got to get over there. That's all there is to it. I got to get over there. I got to find out about this. And then when the, he said, well, I'll tell you, I'll send you anointed cloth. <laughs> I'll send you this stick and you go let, have it laid up on the child. That's very good, it's prophet of God. I, I, I think that's very fine. But as your soul lives. I'll not leave you. I'm going to stay right here until I find out. Amen. Yes, amen. Perseverant. Sure, amen. she's perseverant. Elijah thought, well, get rid of her. Might as well go up the lawn. See, here he went. Perseverant. Their faith had hold of the word. How little Micah, that little uneducated, uh, Woodsman back there could stand before those 400 prophets and speak their contrary to them. Why? He was persevering. They said, by the way, that great big head bishop stood up there with these horns and said, the Lord God spoke to me. Oh, my. The head of the association said, the Lord God spoke to me and witnessed by 400 of these men here. And thus saith the Lord. And the man was sincere. Now, but Micah stood. He said, but I saw Israel scatter like sheep having no shepherd. Yeah, yeah. So he walked up and took his hands and smacked his mouth as hard as he could. He said, which way went the Spirit of God when it went out of me? If you know all about this thing. He said, you'll understand one day. Nahab said, well, now, that's what the, the association said. 
Notice now, you never get in a man under such circumstances as that. But he knew his vision was right. He had faith because his faith said exactly what the Word said. Amen. Amen. So he is persevering. Now I look up to the national authority. There stood Ahab, said, put him in the inner prison and feed him bread and water of sorrow. And when I return in peace, he said, I'll, I'll take care of this fellow. Look at him, persevering yet. Oh, great Ahab, maybe I was wrong. Oh, Bishop, maybe I was wrong. But no, no, not him. He had anchored. He saw a vision, and his vision was with the Word. He said, if you come back at all, I'm a false prophet. Amen. Amen. He was persevering. Amen. Certainly he was. The blind man that I spoke of a while ago, he could argue theology with him. He knew nothing about it. They could say, why, well, so-and-so said so-and-so and so-and-so. He said, I don't know about your theology, but this one thing I know where I was blind, I can now see. His father and mother never had that kind of faith. They said, oh, they'll put us out of the synagogue. So you ask him, he's of age. Brother, there wasn't nothing wrong with him. He said, it's a strange, he said, I'm no theologian. I cannot argue your scriptures that you're talking about. But you said that you know God healed. But this man, you know not whence he come from. Now, it's a strange thing that a man can come here and can open my blinded eyes and you, the leaders of religion, and don't know from whence he come. Yeah. Brother, he was a theologian in my book. He, he, had, he had an argument the rest of the couldn't say the rest of all. How? That you say you don't have no record of his... Is, is coming. You don't have no record on your book of his schooling, where his education come from. Or not. You don't know from whence he come and have the man to give me my sight. <laughs> Pretty good argument, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Philip, when he stood there and seen Jesus of Nazareth tell Simon what his name was and his father's name, he was very persistent. He had a self-starched friend that he wanted to tell about, and he went and found Nathaniel. When Nathaniel standing there before the members of his church, and the high priest, and the Sanhedrin, and all of them standing around, when Jesus looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Oh, I better shut up now. Be careful. There stands the bishop. There stands the gentle overseer. There stands the pastor. There stands all my relation. I better keep still and just act like I don't know him about mm -hmm. See? No, no. Something happened. Philip had showed him a seed. He said, Rabbi! They stand there and say, This man's Beelzebub. Don't listen to that. He's a fortune teller. He's a devil. Don't listen to him. But Philip quickly, or Nathaniel, recognized him as a rabbi, a teacher. He said, Rabbi, when did you ever see me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree. Now what am I going to do? Here's the scripture says that that's the sign of the Messiah. He ran to him and fell down and he said, Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel. I don't care what the rest of them has got to say about it. You are the son of God, the king of Israel. The little woman at the well, when she was told of what was wrong with her, now, you know, if you happen to know the Easter, is there a missionary here? Never been to the East? Well, you understand that a woman like that has got no authority at all to speak to man anywhere. That's right. It's still that way. She does not, cannot speak to man by no means, especially on religious arguments and discussions. But, oh, man, could you keep her quiet? It's like a, a dry house on fire and a high wind. <laughs> you couldn't stop her. She said, come see a man. He told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Amen. Now, I've got, I'm closing now. I've just got to quit. About four or five years ago, I saw a vision to send me down in Mexico. You take the businessman's voice. That, see, before you can print anything, you have to be able to back that up. Now, you can say it. But don't you print it unless you can back it up, because it's printed matter. I was had I've come down on ropes in the back of the arena, the pen where we was at, 
was having about 10,000 a night conversions to Christ. And then, as I looked, Billy come up to me and he said, Daddy, you see all that going on over there on the other side, about 150 yards? So said, that's one little woman. He said, she's not as big as a bar of soap, hardly. Little bitty thing. Said, she's got a dead baby under her arm. And said, I called the man uh, manana tomorrow. He was so slow. They come and got me. He was supposed to get me at 7 o'clock and he got me at 9. Me walking up and down the floors. And he'd done give out all the prayer cards and didn't have no more. I'd only give him about 15 or 20 a night because that's all I could get to. Because if you give them a card, they, they, they don't understand like you. You can't talk to them. So there's, there's just, I'd give them about 10 or 15, whatever. That's all i give out. Well, it, they didn't have any more prayer cards and said she didn't get in with that baby and didn't get no prayer card and said, ah, we got about 150, 200 ushers or maybe more standing down there and they can't hold that little woman. She runs under their legs up over the top of their back and everything else. She's got this dead baby. She's seen that blind man the night before receive his sign. So she said, she won't again. I said, and said, I said, Billy, I, I can't help it. I was talking. I said, Brother Jack Moore. I said, go over there. She don't know who I am. Now, they could never see me way back out like that. And I said, go over there and go down and pray for the baby, and she'll think it's just me, and that's all. He said, that, all right, Brother Bram. He started that way, and I turned around. And I said, now, as I was saying, faith is the... And I looked out there in front of me, and there was a little Mexican baby sitting right out in the middle of the air there, just laughing, no teeth. <laughs> little nursing baby, all right? I looked again, Brother Espinosa. Many of you know Brother Espinosa. So what's the matter? I said, I see a vision. I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. All of you know Jack Moore, I'm sure. Businessman. I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. Just a minute. Billy, go bring the woman here. He said, Daddy, she ain't got a prayer card. I said, don't make any difference. Bring her here. And she, they let her through. Here come a real pretty little woman. And her, the rain is raining and been raining all afternoon and that people stand there and her, her pretty hair hanging down her sides and her face and it was all wet and she was crying and, and with tears running down her cheeks and she come running up there soaking wet in a little blue looking blanket wrapped around a little form and she was holding it out like this and she fell down on her knees and began to cry out something padre padre and I talked her I said stand up brother Espinosa told her and she had the little baby like that, holding it out just like I'd hold that handkerchief. One was laying across her arms like this. And I said, Heavenly Father, I don't know whether this is a baby or not. I just saw a little baby and thinking maybe this was it, being it this happened the way it has. I, I lay my hands upon it and asked for life to return in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the little baby let out a kick and began to scream as hard as it could. And, and it, I said, Brother Espinosa, don't you say anything about that now. Don't give that to the businessman or any of them until you get a signed statement from her doctor. And the doctor signed a statement that the baby died with pneumonia in his office that morning at 9 o'clock, and this is pretty near 11 o'clock at night. Been dead all that time. Why? She was persistent. She believed if God could give a blind man his sight. Give sight to the blind. Give life to the baby. Why? She was persevering. Three hundred ushers, nothing could stop her. She was determined because something anchored. She had never seen any of these things that you all see. The only thing somebody told her that day that a blind man had lived down the street from where she was, had received his sight, had been blind for about ten years, with a coma in his eyes. And that day he was walking down the street crying, waving his hands, and she saw him and her baby died. She picked up the baby from the doctor's office and took out, stood in that rain all day long, waiting for the opportunity. And when she didn't get a prayer card, she still was persistent. She didn't know that she was a Roman Catholic. The only thing she knew that she had to get to some man. Now, 
You know better than that. It's not the man you get to. It's the Christ that you get to. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that you get to. All her faith was in her priest because he was a God to her. But tonight, no man is your God but Jesus Christ. And he shared the same yesterday today and forever. Hallelujah. Let's be persistent as we bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I pray that you help us now. Just a word or two from you, Lord, ought to just do something for these people. I pray thee, Lord, as you promised in the last days, that you would do these things, the works that you did when you were here on earth, that would be repeated again. I give the illustrations of it through the scriptures, like, for instance, Sodom and different places, and we see over the book of the Revelations in the Lady of Sin Age, and oh, how that you made the promise and said you were the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we see it by pictures when the mechanical eye of the camera will catch mysteries in this last days that man cannot explain. God, may men and women tonight who are suffering and sick here, may they be persistent and get to the Lord Jesus at this hour. Go home rejoicing, heal. We ask it in his name, for his glory. Amen. Now, I still am late. I'm thinking this. This may be the last meeting we have together. I may never see you again. You may never see me again until we cross the river. And we all may cross before morning. Remember, this nation is weighed in the balance. We'll get to that when we go to preaching. See? Notice, we don't know when it'll be. So Paul preached all night one night this same gospel. The Lord honored his work when a little fella fell dead like Brother Wade did the other morning. He's sitting right here before me now. Paul laid his body over this boy and his life come back to him. It's the same thing he did to Brother Wade. It shows that the same God, by the same Word, by the same Spirit, does the same thing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then if he's here, now look, there's no man can heal you because you're already healed. Something has to happen in you to tell you that it's for you. And then be persistent. Let's see, what was them cards we give out with A's? A's? Or you just finished giving out the rest of the A's? All right. Where did we start? One, what? We started, we had 15, I believe it was. One to 15. One to 15. Let's start somewhere else along. And let's start from 75, 80, 90. Let's go to 90, 75 to 90. Pick out a little group in there and start from there and then get as we go on from there. Let's start from there see if we can get as many as we can pray for. Let prayer cards 75 to 90 stand first. That will give us 15 to start with. We'll see what the Holy Spirit needs. Uh, bring them over here to the right, if you will. 15 to 90. Or wait, I beg your pardon. What did I say? 75 to 90. 16 of them. It'd be 16. Yeah. 75 to 90. That'd be 16 people. All right. You help me, Brother Bale. No, now, if, they're coming. They're there. If you can't get up, while well, you see it to get help done. All right, Brother Bale, if you will. I want. How many in here that hasn't got prayer cards? And you want to know if Jesus Christ can heal you. Raise up your hand and say, I, I want to accept it. I, I believe. Oh, we won't have to wait for his spirit. I done seen him touch somebody right there in the audience. Amen. Four cards are missing between 75 and 90. (laughs) 
All right? How many out there, how many way back in the back believe? Way back towards the back. Way up in the balconies around. Just say, I believe. Raise up your hand and say, I believe. All right, that's it. That's good. Now, if Jesus Christ, while I'm thinking here, I'm waiting to see whether it's really going to take effect on this person or not. Somebody was touched just then. I've seen it happen. I've never seen the person in my life, but I looked right at him. I've seen it happen. I've seen the person get touched by the Holy Spirit. I could have that person stand right up now and prove that it's the truth. <laughs> Amen. Before the line ever starts. She's still free and she put her handkerchief up to her mouth sitting right back there. She's got spinal trouble. That's right. Sitting right? Yeah. That's your husband raised his hand. <laughs> Listen, I'm stranger to you all. Is that right? Do you believe me to be his prophet? Your spinal trouble is going to leave you. And listen, by the way, the man's got his hand up in as the Holy Spirit struck you. When I talked to your wife, the Holy Spirit struck you. And you got something wrong with you. The growth on the arm, believe and it'll leave you. <laughs> Glory to God. Ask those people if I ever seen them in my life as I know of. They're strangers. But... What faith moving in the power of the Holy Ghost? Do you believe? Amen. Amen. You speak Spanish? Turn around and tell that little girl she can't speak Spanish, can't speak English back there. She's got something wrong with her chest. Turn around and tell her. Jesus Christ heals you, sister. She couldn't even speak English. I've seen her talking Spanish. Now it's got another lady sitting in front of her really excited and she can't speak English. She's Spanish and she's got something wrong with her stomach. <laughs> sitting in front. You believe with all your heart your stomach trouble leaves you and you can go home and be well. <laughs> Amen. God is a healer. See a striker? They had to tell her in Spanish before she realized she can't understand English. Look at there, people that can't even speak English, but just what they're seeing, they, they can presume and feel the Spirit. They can't even hear. Shame on you. Glory to God. i never seen that done yet. <laughs> Amen. Ask them people, why? I can't even speak their language. But you see, it proves you don't have to be in this prayer line. Is that right? You believe what you say amen for? Sitting right there. You believe that sign this trouble's going to lead you? You do? Stand up on your feet. It leaves you. See, she can hear me what I'm saying. These couldn't. That's right. Now tell me, name God. Can't you be persistent if those people who can't understand more and more and more of English presses into it? They was of another nation. But God did that, I believe, because I preached that a few minutes ago. A Greek. Another nation. She was persistent. Watch them see what happens. Is this the lady how do you do? We're strangers to one another. Do you believe Jesus Christ is present to heal you? I could not. I have no, no power to heal. I have authority 
when I receive it from God to pronounce something that God has done. And like Samson, as long as you can feel those locks hanging around, it's all right. When I see him moving among us like this, I know he's here. Don't you? I see you vomiting and having vomiting spells. You're worried about your overweight. Then you've got a growth on your body. Under your rib. That's right. Now. Had quite a time getting up here, didn't you? <laughs> Why did I say get up here? Because you come from, from the southwest from here. You come from Missouri. Go back, Jesus Christ makes your way. <laughs> Another woman, colored woman. Don't know her, never seen her. But she's there's someone coming here, another another race coming one to another. White and colored race. We're all in one blood. You believe the Son of God raised from the dead, and he commissioned his church to do the same thing that he did. You believe that? That church cannot die. Upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell cannot prevail. What was it? Spiritual revelation. If God can reveal to me by His Spirit, you're standing here, what's wrong with you? Just same as He told that woman at the well. That makes Him the same because you're, we're both human beings. Is that right? Now you're very nervous about something, you're worried. Your mind's all tore up. If you've been told something, it's got you alarmed. That was that you got a tumor, and the tumor is in your head. That is right. And they're, you're up for an operation, but they're a little scared about it because you've got a weakness in your heart. That they're afraid to take the operation because of the weakness of your heart. Jesus Christ strengthens your heart. You believe him? He can heal your tumor. You believe him? Then be persistent. Go and go and leave the How do you do? Another man. I don't know him. I seen him a while ago. When I want to come on a platform. I believe he's sitting up here. First time I ever seen you in my life, as far as I know of. All right? Now you're here for some reason. If I, this spirit that's up on me, that, that pillar of fire and light and so forth has been tough, if that's of Jesus Christ, it'll bear a record of the word. If it doesn't, then it's not of Christ. But you're convinced that it is. You are. And you're suffering with a nervous condition, hemorrhoids, that's bothering you. And you're trying to get to see me. On something special. It's a spiritual condition. You're a minister. And it's about your church. I heard that come from you. What you think of that? You say he was a minister because he's sitting on this platform. You know I don't know you, don't you? Do you believe me to be his prophet? Yes, amen. Then Reverend Donaldson, you can go back to your home and believe and you get well and everything will be all right for you. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Yeah. Do you believe? you believe me to be his servant? You know that I cannot do these things? But you believe that he is doing them. It's him that's doing them. Do you believe? That's right. If you just... just now, just for this one time, please, be persistent. Let nothing stand in your way. Press right in. Don't you see it's Him? Don't you know that's Him? See, He wouldn't identify Himself as some great theologian that He wasn't. He wouldn't uh, in, uh, introduce Himself as a, a church politician. He wasn't. 
He was God, made flesh. God is the Word, and the Word is a deserter of the thoughts of the heart. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Can't you see it's Him? How can be a poor, ignorant uh, person like me? With a grammar school education, no matter if I had ever so much education, you still couldn't do that. It's a paradox. What is it? It's the power of God. Can't you see it, friends? Can you break that crust away from you? Here's a woman. Look here. i never seen that woman. Here's a Bible laid before me. i never seen that woman in my life as far as Noah. But her life, she couldn't hide it. Right? Amen. Now, not because she's saying hallelujah. Hypocrites can say that, but the woman's a Christian. She's a believer. And if I will tell you, by God's grace, feeling the seven locks of Samson, what your trouble is, you believe me? Will the audience believe with everyone? She'll know it's right or not. First thing, you're suffering with a high blood pressure. You also have diabetes. You have a nervous condition. And you have something wrong with the head. It's an examination. You got a tumor. Exactly, in the end. And you know it's death unless God touches you or something. Is that right? May the God of heaven who's standing present. Now, come here and let me lay my hands on you. I condemn this devil in the name of Jesus Christ. May it be. Amen. God bless you. Go on your own rejoice in that. You believe? Say he's looking her right in the face. You don't have to look her in the face. Look here, I can look this woman in the face. Now you say she's heavy. That's right. It's thyroid. That's right. But that's not it. That's not what she wants to pray for. She's got a female trouble, a discharge that she wants to pray for. Is that right, lady? Just let you now go on your road rejoicing and saying, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just believe. Anemia? You believe that God can heal you? Just say thank you, dear Jesus. Go right on your road saying praise God and believe. Praise the Lord. Look good and strong. You believe God can heal the stomach trouble and make you well? Go eat. Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. If Christ doesn't touch you, you must die, and you know that. Yes, sir. But God can take every devil of cancer, He can kill the thing and make it well. You believe it? I do. Go believe it in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. and you go and be made well. Amen. Praise the Lord. You don't walk like it just at this time, but you have arthritis. You also have a touch of heart trouble, a little smothering around the heart. Jesus Christ makes you well if you believe it, do you? Rejoicing, sin. Thank you, Lord. You may as well. You believe God can heal your back and make you well? All right, go right on, sin. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, that's right. You believe God can take that, give you a blood transfusion and take that sugar out and make you a real new person? You believe? Bless you, go on your own. Rejoicing, sin. Thank you, Lord. You believe God can take that tumor and make you well? Go right on for God can give you the arthritis and straighten you back up, make you well, you believe it? Go on your own rejoicing. You believe me to be his prophet? I don't know you. God does know you. You're sick yourself, but your big interest is in somebody else. Two sick people, real sick, cancer, dying. Believe with all your heart. Take them, lay it on it. Amen. Believe and don't doubt. You'll get well. If you don't get well. Have faith. All right, sir. I believe you're one of the ministers who sat on the platform here. As far as knowing you, I don't. Jesus Christ knows your heart. He knows what's in man. Do you believe that? If God will tell me what your trouble is, then are you ready? You are. You ministers know this man. I believe yes, sir. Yeah. All right, you know him. All right? The thing of it is that you're really 
the trouble is you're suffering from a nervous breakdown. You're having some kind of a mental scruples in your mind. It's oppression from Satan. This has been going on for some time. It's caused your body to get weak. Your heart's weak. You're in a very bad shape. By this, your whole family is just about into a breakdown. Sir, you've been waiting for a word, haven't you? You accept my word? Then in the name of Jesus Christ, I send you home to be well. That devil shall not. Are you believing? Do you believe? Now put your hands over on one another. Now I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, your great divine presence, there's no one could doubt. Everyone knows that you're here. They know that it's you now. Let them be persistent. Let these, Lord, who these miracles, a whole line full of them, 16 here in the line and a group out there in the audience, above anything that any man on earth could do himself, no earthly man here could do these things except God be there. We know it. How perfect, how exact. I pray thee, Father, to let the people see this. And let them be perseverant now. They have their hands on one another. And in their hearts is beating high. The royal blood of Jesus Christ by faith flowing from one to another. And now, Lord, hear the prayer of your servant. As your servant, I condemn every sickness, every disease that's in the divine presence of the resurrected Christ. May the devil lose his hope. May each soldier now with his sword locked against Satan's doubt, with a persistent faith, rise pressing that sword until it strikes the innermost part of that devil and drives him completely away.